Now, depending upon what type of uh, component that you end up, um, or array, or polar array um, that you develop, um, you know, you're going to have to think about how this would ultimately tile. Now, when we're talking about transformation, and specifically talking about um, things that are going to work through morphing, we really have to start to think about um, issues of how these things can tile to one another. So let's take a look at this. And we'll notice the difference between this guy, um, which we did by a polar array, and this one, which we're doing by a mirror. All right. Now, if I were to take this and copy, I can see that I can copy up, right? And this will continue to tile correctly in this axis. Now, if I copy this over, you'll see that I have gaps here. There's a hole. Now, if you design a detail here, perhaps this is not an issue, right? That might be totally acceptable. If you don't want to design a detail here at the corner, perhaps you want to go ahead and design an infill that would go here. So let's say something like a triangle. I'll go ahead and scale that triangle the same way I did that one. And if I perform the same mirroring operations I did before, you can see I have the rest of my component now, right? So this is really important to understand because, you know, we're going to be relying upon um, some space to be able to transfer the component to the substrate. Um, so tileability is hugely important. So you have to think about these things um, when you're wanting to be able to array these things or or uh, morph these and, and have them continuous. When we look at this component, if I copy this from here to here, up to here and here, you'll see that I also have gaps. So a similar um, solution could be used, which would be to go ahead and just take a triangle and add that to your polar array. So now we have the ability to tile and have these continuous face to face. And you'll see you get a, it's a very different texture that you achieve. So the first step when we're developing uh, the initial geometry or the uh, component geometry that we would like to um, to morph is to really think about issues of tileability and continuity where seams are occurring and here again you can see that we are primarily dealing with that edge uh, to edge detail whereas here in the components um, that we modeled for your reference you can see that that hole was something that we wanted to keep, and so we just added it an extra edge here and here, giving us this geometry. All right, now, how do we go from line work to actually um, having something um, which can um, be rendered as a surface? Here, I'm going to go ahead and just call this my component lines. And then I'm going to call this other layer my component meshes. Now, the reason why we're going to transition into meshes, um, there are two, two, two reasons, really. Uh, the first one is that the meshes are going to be very, very lightweight. So when we decide to move into morphing, we might want to be able to experiment with a pretty high degree of change in terms of moving from, say, three components to 30 components to 300 components, registering a transformation. 
when you're working with surface geometry, that can be problematic uh, because of the way that it's computed. So uh, using meshes, uh, which is a much lighter weight type of geometry, we can ensure that we'll be able to have a much more dynamic experience um, in the way that we're developing um, the morph um, without the expense of having uh, our computers really slow down a lot. So I'm not sure how many of you have worked with meshes. I know a few of you attended um, our subdivision modeling webinar, um, so you've had an introduction to meshes. Um, but the type of mesh that we're going to be using is located here under mesh polygon mesh primitives, and it's called a 3D face. Now, this is a really cool tool, um, and it's not that unlike something you've probably used a bunch of times before, like a polyline. So starting at a corner, I'm going to use my snaps, and I'm going to click in a counterclockwise orientation to draw my faces. Now I'm going to repeat this process for the uh, geometry here, my polylines, in this first quadrant. Now again, as I mentioned, uh, my preferred method of modeling is really to think through primitives and transformations and rely on being able to say take this and then just repeat my array polar to facilitate the rest of the modeling. I, I really don't want to, to have to model all of that. Um, so in the end I end up just uh, modeling something uh, which is based on a quadrant or, or whatever I need to break down my component as. So you can see here the kind of design elements. I'm going to select all of these and I'm just going to go ahead and say join. Now in the command line you'll see that it says 28 meshes, so that's how many of these little faces I had drawn, um, are now joined into one. So that's, that's really great stuff. And um, if I bounce over to your perspective, you can see that the mesh, uh, by turning on your control points, now you can do that from the toolbar here. You can also do that by going to edit control points on and you'll notice that there's also uh, F10 as a hotkey. Now, with these control points on, you can select by holding down shift multiple control points and begin to edit your mesh. So I'm just going to pull these guys up. So now I have a component that looks like this. So these guys are all going up, so perhaps my triangles, I'll go ahead and have them going down. Try to add a little bit of texture to both the top as well as the bottom of this component. I'll just snap this guy going down. Awesome. So you can see it's a, it's a, a pretty dynamic uh, little component with uh, not too much modeling involved. All right, so this will be our design elements. This is what we're going to try to try to take around a little bit and, and uh, use in our modeling. Now I'm going to go ahead and move this over. Um, no, I'll just leave it where it is. And uh, just remember that you know this is the component that we're going to be using. 